Your evolution creatively and lyrically and artistically has always intrigued me too because after In Control Volume 2, I was surprised with the Tragedy Saga of a Hoodlum album, uh, which came out next because A, Marley, K Def, I think, did the majority of it, but then Marley did a little bit, but not much. And then also um, the In Control Volume 1, Intelligent Hoodlum, and In Control Volume 2, you had a like a controlled fury, like it was focused, but it wasn't uh, anger. Whereas this album, Tragedy Saga of Hoodlum, you sounded angry. And I wanted to know what had happened to you or what made you make this such a dramatic shift vocally, lyrically, profane, profanity-wise, all this stuff. You just seemed very angry. That's, it, it, to me, I just wanted to be more aggressive. And if you look at it, though, if you look at it, just as much as it was aggression, you had Grand Groove on it, which had a Patrice Russian sample. Right. Excuse me. And that's not really aggression. That's not really angry. In fact, it became number one billboard. It was number one in billboard. You know what I mean? It charged in billboard. And, you know, that was a total contrast. But for the rest of the album, you know, I wanted to kind of. It was more or less me doing the album on my own. And I wanted to kind of, uh, I had more say-so in that album, I should say. And I just I just felt aggressive. And that's how I was feeling at the time. You know, a lot was going on in my personal life. And uh, I was feeling myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> just to be honest. With me. <laughs> so what, what, uh, what made you feel yourself in that way that was so different? Um, I was feeling myself in a sense where I had a little more control. I was feeling myself in the sense that, you know, I was seeing a lot of injustices going on in the streets with police. And I just was getting tired of it. You know what I mean? And when it came down to it, I was like, you know, I want to go out and do this shit, but that would be totally backwards. So let me, you know, let me just take it out on the mic. Okay. You know? And then what did you see that KDEF brought to Tragedy Saga of a Hoodlum that helped you or affected you different creatively that he was doing production-wise? KDEF brought more like a funky kind of vibe to it. He brought like a jazzy, hard edge, funky kind of vibe. And, um, you know, he was under Marley's, part of Marley's production crew. So Marley would come on top of it. And I just thought it would made for a good combination where Cause that's where the, that's where the times were going musically, and Molly putting his signature on it just brought it out even more. So I just felt like, let me get up in this, you know what I'm saying? Let me let me let me bob and weave and throw my shots, you know what I mean? And um, it just came across musically. It just came out on the mic. Um, again, K Def K Def was a brilliant producer, man. Um, he doesn't get a lot of the credit he deserves either. But um, as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the brilliant ones. Yes. Yes, I agree. Uh, K-Def and Larry O. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The real live Larry shit. Larry O. K-Def and Larry O. That's right, man. Yeah. Always check. Phenomenal stuff. Now, with, Phenomenal. Uh, with funk mode, I was always intrigued when people do this, like using a, the same or similar beat to like brand Nubian punks jump up to get beat down. Yeah. So, so for you, being that you're an executive, being that you're an artist, being that you work with artists, being that you do so many different levels of the game, back in 93, and as you look at it now, what effect do you have or do you think it has artistically when people close together time-wise are using similar type of beats like that? Um, Sometimes it can be bad. Sometimes it can be good. You know what I'm saying? Um. You never really know where it's going to fall until it falls, until it lands. It can fall on the bad side, it can fall on the good side. Um, To me, if, if if you're passionate about it, then that's all that counts. You know what I mean? Um, That's all that counts. If you're passionate about it and your heart is in it, you got to do what you feel. You know what I'm saying? You got to do what you want to resonate, what you want to get across. And, you know, sometimes it comes at a price, man. Sometimes you got to say, damn, I shouldn't use that shit, man. Because this particular record drowned my record out. 
Or sometimes you just got to say, fuck it. I did what I wanted to do. I did what, you know, one record doesn't necessarily have to be your end all, be, be all. It can. But how would you live and how would you advance and progress if you was always afraid if it was or it wasn't? So. Yeah. I just, part of the reason I asked because uh, Brand Nubians, of course, was that punch up to get beat down such a big record. But I've never minded it. And I always get intrigued when uh, people are like, oh, you shouldn't use the beat or this. I'm like, people use James Brown 7,000 times and nobody cares. A million times. A million times. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So I always, but since uh, I really liked Funk Mode, I thought it was a great song. But, yeah. but you know, the punk show up to get beat down is just, that's just an iconic song. So I was just, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was, it was a bigger song. It was a bigger song. And, you know. I'm fucking, I'm glad for my brothers. You know what I mean? I love them. I love, I love Grand Pooba. I love Sadat X. I love Lord Jamal. Those are my, that's my family. You know what I'm saying? So it's all good, man. Like, I don't, I don't see it, you know, I don't see it being any competition in terms of, you know, winning or losing in that sense. If my brothers win, I win, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they say, I want for my brothers, like I want, I want for myself, but like I want for my brothers. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like, I don't, you know, I love them dudes, man. I love them. Those are those are a few brothers in the game that I love, like family. Like that's family. Hmm. Okay. And with tragedy uh, saga of a hoodlum, the grand groove is so different than a lot of the albums. So why, uh, especially sonically? So what made you have that on there to where it is so dramatically different? Um, because grand groove was dramatically different. I just told you. Like, that was somebody, you know, I could call in the midst of the hellfire, and she'd be like, baby, you're going to do it. Don't worry about it. Listen, you're going to, listen, you're going to be fine. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I love you, Poopy. I love, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, you know what? That deserved to be on a different type of level. You know what I mean? And, and what better? See, for me, like, those are records I grew up loving. So it was easier for me to put that emotion on that type of record. So it just had to be that way, you know, call it commercial, call you whatever you want to call it. Hip hop started off with dudes rhyming over party beats, which were what? Commercial R&B. So it's all how you deliver it. You know what I mean? It's all how you deliver it. So for me, it's like, yo, that's that's the bed or canvas that I could paint that picture on. So I wouldn't care. Like, yo, I might make a record. I might make a record if I feel it off of a fucking violin, just one violin with no beat under it. And then the rest of the album, it sounds totally contrary to it. It doesn't matter to me. If you're looking at a whole body of work, when you look at a whole body of work, right, and you understand the body of work and you see the picture, then that's all it's about. It doesn't, the consistency doesn't have to be in the sound. The consistency could be in the body of work and the overall message that the body of work delivers. Right. It's okay. like being on a ride. You know what I'm saying? You might be on a fucking roller coaster ride. You know, the consistency is the ride, not the fact that it's going up and going backwards and going sideways. The consistency is within the ride itself. Right. At least to me. Yes. All right. So I see we've been talking forever. I know I got a thousand questions for you, but let me ask a couple before you got a couple more minutes. So I could ask. The couple. Yeah, I got a couple more. I got a couple more. I got to okay. call wifey back in a second, though. Yes, yes. But no, I just looked. I was like, man, we've been talking a minute. Um, and thank you. So You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So with Tragedy Saga of a Hoodlum and then the album comes out, does what it does. I was always intrigued on when, when we get to the war report, the executive producer. So people use titles, people say this or that. So for you, what was being one of the executive producers on the war report, what did that mean? What was that? The executive producer on that particular album for me, man, helping to come up with the body of work, helping to direct, helping to steer the body of work, helping to have the vision for the body of work, you know, and sometimes the body of work starts with a few songs or sometimes it starts from the beginning to the end. Or sometimes it starts way before the album even starts. And, still continues way before the album even finishes or way after the album finishes, that's the same. Mm. With, with the war report, it's a little of all those things. 
Okay. Now I remember too, because I've interviewed Capone and Noriega multiple times myself, and mm -hmm. I love I love that album. And I was always intrigued as we see a little bit later in rap that the promotion was so big on people's criminal records. And I know that uh -huh. they met they met while they were incarcerated. Yeah. And I, I wanted to know for penalty records, for Tommy Boy, did their uh and even for you. Did their criminal backgrounds matter? Did they care? Did they um, want to um, sweep it under the rug? Like, because it's so me, different now. <laughs> I'm the one who started that. I'm the penalty didn't start that. Tommy Boy ain't start that. And I started that for a specific reason. At that particular time, everybody looked at who was thorough in the street, who was real in the street. Now, not to, it wasn't a glorification, but it was kind of like a, 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 a rites of passage amongst peers and in, a, in an industry where so many people weren't who they say they were. So it's like, okay, these dudes actually met here, right? Not to say, hey, kids, go to fucking prison, you know what I'm saying, and meet your fucking best friend. Meet your bunk buddy. Your cell buddy is going to become your fucking, your, your partner in your rap group, and you're going to make millions of dollars. Nah, it's to say this is an authentic relationship that started here the same way it could have been an authentic relationship if they went to fucking Georgetown private school or St. John's private school. But if if there's so much emphasis on everyone, on every on the game, placing around these so-called stories that never really happened, and I know for a fact they never really happened, then maybe you'll take interest in this particular relationship that's authentic. And it's still authentic. And you can see that it's still authentic to this day. Right. And then Even with what, all the ups and downs. And what did you, uh, what were you able to apply to the war report in, that you hadn't been able to really do much for yourself in your own career? Tragedy, tragedy, intelligent hoodlum had a certain history that we all know. Um, in the war report, I was able to be tragedy Gaddafi. I was able to be, show more of my street knowledge. Just like you had, Ice Cube, when he said, you're about, or easy, when he said, you're about to witness the strength of street knowledge. You know what I'm saying? To me, that was my NWA. My East Coast NWA. My third world Queens NWA. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then as your career progressed and in getting more into production, putting out a lot of albums, doing a lot of collaborations, how do you say, or how would you say that you really, really stepped up your game? Is it more business-wise? Is it more artist-wise? Um, I, step, I stepped up my game more business-wise in, in, in sense, like, now, like, I don't really do, I do features here and there, but now, like, I do projects. I do indie, I do a lot of indie projects, you know, and it's not just, and I love doing them because, you know, I basically get control over the project. I do a lot of indie projects and I stepped up. I stepped up business wise in terms of like now I know how to help promote an indie project. I know, I know, I knew then too, but now it's easier in a sense where it's, it's it's a better flow for me now where I know how to set it up much better. You know, um, even within my own my own demographics. Also, too, artist wise, and again, business wise, I have a lot more relationships meaningful relationships like I can get an artist on a billboard in Midtown like right now you know what I'm saying I can get an artist you know into 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 some good rotation with satellite radio depending on the quality of the work and the story and attraction you know and and that says a lot you know what I'm saying where you know that can cost someone a lot of money whereas with me it may not cost as much you know what I mean um and there's a value in that there's a perceived social value in that. You know what I mean? Um, Artist-wise, I feel, and it's not just me saying it, even, even the public has said it, lyrically, I've gotten even better. You know what I mean? I've grown, and um, I, I take pride in that. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you got the frontline generals. Do you have other stuff that's coming up? I know Intelligent Hood, you oh, said. Oh, yes. I have, I, have a, um, I have a conspiracy a conspiracy show I'm doing now um, based on conspiracies and hip hop conspiracies in the world. Um, 
I have On The Chow, of course, Hip Hop's real first cooking show. Um, and I have the Oral Report 2 I'm about to drop, as well as the Intelligent Hoodlum uh, uh, Resurrection album, or EP, I should say. So, um, yeah, man, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm happy about all of those projects because, you know, they're basically mine. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing, baby. Beautiful right. thing. Well, Tragedy, man, really appreciate speaking with you, and thanks for coming through to Unique Access, man. Yo, sorry, man. Let's do this again, baby. Man, we got to. I just, I was like, man, <laughs> it's been a long, a long interview already, and I barely asked you a lot of stuff, so. It's always part two, family. Yes, yes. But, uh, man, it's an honor to speak to you, man. I've really been uh, appreciative of it, and I'm glad we can make it happen. In the beginning, hip-hop was ruled by the East Coast. Then the West Coast rose to prominence, thanks to gangster rap. Hip-hop changed the world. Gangster rap changed the narrative. And then changed the world again. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shape gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do.